Right. The, the initial motivation goes back at least 10 years. The idea was that uh, college textbooks in particular were becoming extraordinarily expensive. Uh, it is a social justice issue. The rise of MOOCs and other uh, large program delivery methods uh, led to the possibility at least of uh, higher education being available to a much larger population uh, than it typically has met. The concept of open is that these materials are, are there's really two definitions. So there's a, it, a local definition that it would be a definition within your own institution. You make the material freely accessible to your students usually almost exclusively through, through some uh, computer-based uh, delivery system. So we use, a, a, at my college, we use a system called Blackboard, but other colleges have other delivery systems. And on that, you can upload lectures, uh, PowerPoint presentations, videos, um, any kind of interactive multimedia. Um, but the definition gets a little more complicated because philosophically the idea is to have your material freely accessible to anybody in the world, uh, be it usually would be a, a, a faculty member at another college who might be looking for just the right module to use within one of their courses. Now that becomes complicated. You have to be very careful about uh, issues of uh, plagiarism. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if I should say this, but faculty are notorious for just jumping into the internet and grabbing things. And the Creative Commons. It's a system of licensure that uh, allows you to define how you want your work used. So it could be anywhere from absolutely freely usable, uh, rewritten, revised, uh, redistributed in any way, even, even commercially. Uh, that's at one end. At the other end, uh, which is what most people use, it's called CC BY. So if I put out material, I, it would be expected to be distributed freely but it should say CC by Howard Miller, which is my name. Um, the idea, however, that, bec that becomes problematic because where do you store all of this material so that somebody else can find it? Also, how do you convince your university uh, administration that, oh yes, uh, I'm going, not only are we going to develop this material, but we're going to give it away to everybody who wants it. It's not that I'm opposed to it, but I suspect that, that th these are um, things that have to be carefully uh, thought about before entering uh, into, the, into this, uh, the wonderful world of open ed. Um, also, and, and you mentioned this a, a moment ago, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. I'm all in favor of using uh, selective modules where it makes sense for your students. Uh, if you can turn an entire course into open, that's fine. But you know, you're not, you're not going to be condemned, uh, at least not by me, if you were to take part of your course or some of your course, or have the students purchase a some hopefully much less expensive kind of textual support material to go along with it. Uh, I'm not ready to shut down the publishing houses as yet. Uh, some of my colleagues may, but I, I don't believe in that. They have a lot to offer as well. I also think the open movement is pressing the uh, publishers to provide more mm, creative and less expensive alternatives because they feel the push for that. They don't want to be pushed out of business. So it, it's something to think about. Right. The issues that faculty face in, in trying to convert existing courses into uh, open ed based courses. So 
putting aside the textbook and creating interactive materials uh, for their students to use. Um, you have to find faculty who really have a social justice bent, who really want to um, have more students find success in college. Um, it, 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 there's never a question of watering down standards or expectations. I don't even want to talk about that. that that's ridiculous. Um, it is a question of, of engaging the students more. But in order to do that, it takes a lot of work from the faculty. Uh, at Mercy College, we had, we got involved with a grant project that supported our work on this, uh, sponsored by uh, Lumen Learning. And, um, but we had no, we, we invented as we went along. And I would suspect inventing as you go along is going to be the model for a long time. Uh, uh, along with convincing the upper administration that they provide, uh, please, instructional designers who have, who are very uh, multimedia savvy, who know how to handle the equipment and what software is out there. You need, it's not even IT, it really is instructional designers uh, who know how to use, who know the late, who they just, just nerds. They just totally understand the latest, the best, what's available, preferably using, uh, using production material that is also available, open. And there is production material out there that's open. So uh, we haven't gone much beyond short video clips and uh, pre uh, prezzies and uh, you know, voice over PowerPoints. Uh, but that's a start, and I think pretty much anybody, if we could do it, you could do it. I'm telling you that I absolutely had no, I just, we just made this up as we went along using as much support as we could gather. But each semester it gets better. Each time we run a course, it's better than the time before. If we all live to be a thousand, we're going to have it, we're going to have these courses at perfection. As, as an academician, as a college professor, I have some expertise in my area. In my field, I have a couple of uh, areas that I do. One is critical reading, and, and the rest is teacher preparation, especially uh, middle school and high school teacher preparation. And we have courses, we have courses that exist. We have been trying over time to make them less dependent on, on very expensive textbooks and, and converting the, the courses into open ed uh, based courses. Uh, we have, over time, have found that there are lots of uh, problems involved, lots of challenges involved. For one thing, we are not, uh, we are not instructional designers. Uh, we need the help of a good instructional designer to convert our ideas into something both uh, multimedia, visual, auditory, and interesting and engaging for the students, well, that, that's an essential component. Um, uh, you would think that it would be relatively easy to search the internet for good open materials to use in a course. But we're not a MOOC. We're not a. We're not. We're not trying to meet the needs of the entire population of the world in a single course. We're trying to meet local needs, the needs of our students, the interests of our college, uh, within a course. We also, uh, because I'm in a field that has accreditation and answers to the uh, a state authorities with licensure for the teachers that we uh, come up with. We have a lot of constraints on what, what we need to provide to our students. That stuff is not available through an internet search. So it's a matter of constantly working through a course and creating moments, perhaps, or what we call course modules. So we might take a 15-week course and concentrate on 
in, in one semester maybe concentrate on one or two or three elements of that course that we can turn to, uh, into OER material, uh, resource uh, for the students. So when, when you start working on this, it becomes, OER becomes a support for what exists and it takes a very long time to switch that around to where any kind of um, official text material becomes the support for the course and eventually if you're lucky and if you stick with it the textbook goes away uh, but don't think it goes away overnight it, it takes a great deal of work uh, as an example um, what's easier for a professor to do you take a and let's not even criticize a textbook. Let's say we have this terrific textbook written by one or more experts in the, the specific thing that we're trying to cover. And we'll take the textbook and we'll uh, look at our 15-week uh, term and uh, divide the readings ac across the 15 weeks and develop assessments, assignments, activities around it. Because really that has worked for a very long time. It isn't a terrible thing. Uh, but the only time you really upgrade your course is when the textbook gets a new edition. With uh, using OER, you have to upgrade your course all the time. Uh, let's say you're using something from an internet source. You never know from semester to semester whether that link will still be there and whether that source will be there. If that source is not updated periodically, it will grow old, will not be up to date, will not be something you can use. Um, and it, each piece of that, while they look very good now, uh, are constantly being modified and they took year, three years to develop. Uh, this is a, a, a big task, uh, a message to administrators at the college level would be to find a way to support your faculty. This is not simply about dumping the expensive textbook and we cannot have the college administration simply saying, oh sure, go ahead and do it, we don't care, in your own time and you know, at four o'clock in the morning if you want to work on it, that's fine. That, that can't be the, the approach we take. The college, the amount of money that students spend for textbooks needs to be absorbed somewhere else and used for either hiring instructional designers or providing release time or some compensation for faculty to do this work. It, it takes an extraordinary amount of time to, uh, to work on an open ed course. And if you want to collaborate with others in within your college, or even better, with people from across other campuses or other colleges, then the problems are multiplied. There's been enough research. It's, it's still how much research, when this has been only going on for a few years, not enough. But we've collected enough evidence, both um, hard data and anecdotal, to suggest that this is effective. We know anecdotally that the students prefer this approach. We know anecdotally, well, and from experience, that a textbook driven course doesn't really take off until several weeks into the course because the students don't buy the books right away or they don't buy them at all. Uh, and so if you have a course laid out with open ed materials, everything is accessible the first day of class and you don't have to spend your, a lot of time uh, bemoaning the fact that the students didn't do the reading or didn't do the, or didn't even buy the textbook. Um, they're more likely to, they're more willing to listen to a five minute presentation before they come to class and maybe do a short uh, activity or exercise that they bring to class which then becomes the starting point for the lesson for that class. We have enough evidence to show that's true. 
We also have, I'm not crazy about data that's based on grades. Uh, we, you, it's hard to trust um, uh, grades for a course because we know there's a wide variability in, in how things are graded, but using that, um, we do see uh, in comparative to classes that are not run using an OER model, uh, the OER classes, the, the performance is higher. Uh, we've had a lot of success with our, with the uh, math, the uh, Algebra 1 class, which everybody takes, every, every one of our undergraduate students takes. It was adopted, and an entire program was adopted for that using open ed materials. And the math faculty are thrilled to death with the results, not only of the scores higher, attendance is higher, uh, passing the course is higher, you know, being more prepared for Algebra 2 is higher. Uh, it's just that is that kind of it, it, well, Yes, it is. It's okay. they, they, uh, well, some of the professors teach it in a computer lab, uh, but that, those are hard to come by. So some of them would have them do some of the watching of the material at home and then bring it in and some actually run the videos in, in class depending on the equipment and the setup. Uh, access, but we have to be, <laughs> I'm always the skeptic, so research suggests that at least at this point the, the people take, who are taking advantage of large open access courses, MOOCs, are actually middle class, upper middle class, uh, not the folks that we were hoping to reach. So while it's in certain parts of Asia and Africa, the movement is spreading, not enough. And you know, there needs to be infrastructure. If, if uh, someone is living in a, in a region without electricity and, uh, and internet, uh, having internet accessible open courses is not going to do it. So there's a lot of work and, and it, it's going to take time and money and effort. Uh, I still feel like we're in its infancy and that, um, that it will be, and I don't consider myself an expert by any means, but it is within, going to be within the hands of some kind of connection between uh, academic people like myself and uh, uh, instructional designers who know how to uh, take the thoughts and ideas of the academic side and turn them into something uh, that is uh, more accessible for young students. Uh, short videos, uh, uh, short, all of this has to be short. Our, our students today are, are used to uh, quickly accessing information. Uh, I'm sure most people understand that most textbooks are bloated. They're overloaded to, to come up with, uh, you know, they, they, they want to be three, four, five hundred pages when they could be 50. So think of the open ed classroom as converting the 500 page textbook into the 50 page of essentials. And uh, the professor's still there. We, it's not like we go home and, 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 you know, take a nap. We're still there. Our job then becomes either through an online course, direct communication with the students on an individual basis. If you're going to design a course with OER, you start with your learning outcomes and then you design your materials around it. You either design it yourself or with your collaborators or by finding somebody with expertise who has already produced materials that you can use. If you do, a, if you do like your students do, and rely on Wikipedia to be your course, then chances are the quality won't be there. If you carefully vet the materials that you use the way you did when you wrote your doctoral dissertation, um, you will find you have high quality materials. But again, this needs to be updated and upgraded and, and you, the, the work is not done. This is a constant every semester. You need to look at all your modules, make sure 
the ones you really like a lot are still working, and the ones that you're not crazy about, you need to upgrade them. Uh, it, it takes, I would say, it takes at least three years to, to switch a course from textbook dependent to more, even not even completely, but close to completely open. A lot of, uh, a lot of interactions with my students with my online courses and face-to-face um, -face courses. So uh, the term is flipped classroom, where s some of the work is done via the internet or via the website prior to class. Class becomes more like a workshop model where they're actually working on the things that they prepared for. Uh, we do know that uh, retention is high. I mean, there's enough initial research to show that when students are engaged as they are in a good open ed course, um, retention is higher, persistent to graduation is higher. We know very well that a lot of people start college and do not finish. So we would like to get more people in, more people all the way through, and that's kind of the goal.